Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I'm very glad to be here with you on September 26th, 2023. <clears throat> so over the last uh, year and a half now, I have been uh, conducting independent research on, I guess we could say water-based UFO reports or UAP reports, USO cases, that is unidentified submersible objects. Uh, this is a project that's been incredibly engaging for me. Uh, it's actually, I would go so far as to say it's exciting research, and uh, I can't begin to say how much I have personally learned, not just about USOs and doing this research, but just about the UFO or UAP phenomenon in general. It's really opened up a whole additional avenue for me to just look into and be fascinated by. So in that, um, in the course of all of that, I've frequently shared some of that research here on this channel. I have shared as much or even more on my webpage, uh, richardolemembers.com. Um, in fact, about one week ago, I did a, a special presentation on the history of the aircraft carrier, the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, and it's four. Uh, apparent UFO encounters that we know about from the 1950s alone, four in one decade for that that very important aircraft carrier. I'll come back and talk about that publicly here a little more. I think I have discussed it to uh, some extent already. Uh, other major aircraft carriers, the USS John F. Kennedy is another big one that's had just uh, quite a few UFO, USO encounters. And it's just really a kind of a mind-blowing experience. And uh, I'm mentioning it here because we're in an era where we're hearing statement after statement now coming from the Pentagon, coming from the um, All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, that is Arrow. Uh, we're hearing it com coming from NASA recent study in their press conference that there's just no data uh, relating to these UF UAP reports that they're looking at. There's no data. We need more data. We've got to get... And I, I hear this and I think there's something wrong here. There's a definite disconnect happening here. You're telling me you're not getting data. And I am going through the history, in this case, mostly of the U.S. Navy currently, and I am finding one extraordinary case after another, after another. They just, it's not just a few. There's a lot of them. And, uh, you know, you think about how important <laughs> an aircraft carrier is to the United States Navy Command. Uh, you don't really have to use a lot of imagination to realize those things are the single most important, like, things in the world to those guys. This is a, a carrier that carries four to 5,000 or more uh, sailors on it. They have nuclear weapons. They've got fighter jets on them. These are important. And yet we've had had many, many cases of um, encounters by aircraft carriers and also other big shit, battle cruisers and other destroyers and the like, all of them out there engaging or encountering utterly unexplainable, highly advanced phenomena that in several cases, and I'm going to recount one of them here, disabled the ship for a good 30 minutes. I talked about one of those cases on this channel a, uh, a few months ago. That was with the USS John F. Kennedy in the early 1970s in the Caribbean. I have another one here that I will describe for you shortly. So there, apparently this is a thing that has happened more than once for, we're talking top of the line U.S. Navy ships. Is anyone really credibly going to maintain that there's no data? on these encounters. Not believable, not credible, not at all. I'm not saying that the folks making these statements are lying. They may not just have the data themselves. Very good possibility of that. I don't know. But to say that there's no data, no. Not accepting that, you should not accept that either. It's not a credible statement. So I was going through uh, some of the cases uh, that I wanted to prepare prepare for this presentation. And the problem I had is that there were simply too many. I had too many to go through. Uh, too many that I had selected. I've, I've only selected five for you here. That's all that I can really do for this time. I do 
promise I will be coming back with more of these cases. And by the way, I don't mean to just pick on the Navy. Uh, I've been looking at the Navy cases a lot lately, so that's what's in front of me. But uh, there's an Army, there's an Air Force in the United States, uh, both of which those services have had many, many unknown, lost, concealed encounters with UAP, or as I like to say, UFOs. And I will be doing everything I can to come back and highlighting those as well. But right now, let's let's keep working on the Navy. That's been kind of in um, my main focus for the past uh, more than a year. And so I'd like to keep that going. Now, for these cases, and I am pretty confident in saying that no one really is, is familiar with these cases. These are all taken from this website I'm showing you here. That is the National UFO Reporting Center. You have probably heard me many times talk about this website. It is an absolutely an irreplaceable resource for UFO researchers, UAP researchers. There is nothing like this. MUFON's got a, a database, but you can't just go into their database if you're just a regular person like me. <laughs> I'm not a MUFON investigator. I can't get in there. Uh, so for the general public, the New Fork, that's National UFO Reporting Center, this database is irreplaceable. And by the way, they've just done a, a pretty nice upgrade of the interface in there. So you go to the, where it says data bank and you click that and you can then go into the cases. They're, they're not great to search. Like it's not a searchable database in the sense if you want to, I mean, there's a search bar there, but it doesn't, I've tried this. So it doesn't really work for specific, the, the cases that are put in there, which really it that's what would make it incredible. But there are ways of going through it. I have my methodology. I've been going through that website pretty regularly for quite some time. So I've found many, many, many cases and I'm continually going through it. And, and so I've got five here that I'm going to share with you. Um, these are not recent cases. These are early cases. They're mostly from the 1960s and 70s. The last one of them uh, is from 1980 or 1981. Uh, there are many more recent ones that I will be sharing with you in the future. So this is not all ancient history. But the thing about this is that we should not consider these old cases ancient history. That's not the right way to look at this. Uh, we're looking at a historical phenomenon, and we need, absolutely need, to preserve the history of the UFO phenomenon. If we're going to have any genuinely realistic, common sense, uh, intelligent conversations about the subject, we've got to remember the history. We're in an era in which history is just being whitewashed, not just with UFOs either, but with seemingly everything, but certainly with UFOs. The history of that is being whitewashed, as far as I can see, by official statements. And you can say it's by design. You can say it's not by design, but whatever, it is happening. And uh, I'm not happy about it. And I don't think you should be either. I don't want to take this sitting down. So my um, interest in this is to preserve, uh, resurrect that history to the extent possible. So these are five cases that have been just sitting in the database of the National UFO Reporting Center. They are individual witness testimony. That's all that there there is. Um, you might say, well, you know, who cares? It's just one guy's story many years after the fact. That's true. But you think about what the UAP task force and then the Arrow office have been doing of late. What are they doing? They're interviewing people from the military. They're taking testimony from individuals in a safe environment, and they are taking their stories. Now, they have an advantage, which is that they can confirm the identity of the person that they're speaking to. They can, you know, look at their um, their military records and so forth. And it's true, we don't have that opportunity to do that when there's a, a, a submission to the National UFO Reporting Center. Yeah. But let's just be realistic here. You read through these cases, the individuals are giving exact specific information about the ship they were on, where they were, the mission and all of that. Like you can see, they were there. Um, we're, we're getting our testimony just as 
the Arrow office or the old UAP task force office was getting their data. And this is what is available to us. And I think it is incumbent on us to go through these cases as carefully and meticulously as we can and um, to relate them and perhaps make some sense out of them. So I've got a few here. I want to start off. I'm going to just show you a little screenshot of the case. Uh, this is just for you. You can read this later or you can look it up on your own on the website. In fact, the screenshots I have are uh, from pre-website upgrade. They've just recently upgraded the website. So this one is from the Azores Islands. This is the early fall of 1965. It was listed as September 1st, but that's just an estimate. Uh, the writer said, you know, late summer, early fall, 1965. He was uh, on the ship, the USS Albany GC-10. And I'm going to go through, I've got some bullet points for this. And um, I mean, the bullet points are small, but look, you can screenshot it. You can look at it, study it later, what have you. So what you have is a, a two-hour event that happened aboard the USS Albany early fall of 1965. So the writer was an electronic technician. He his rank was ET3R, is what he said. He's aboard the Albany, uh, which he said was a guided missile cruiser. It had been commissioned just two years earlier, so it was a fairly uh, young ship. So his uh, this individual, by the way, like a lot of these folks, is anonymous, but he um, gave a lot of technical information about what he was responsible for. And essentially, it was all of the ship's radar systems. Uh, and he, he gave a list of them, he, the SPS-30, the SPS-43, the SPS-39, the SPS-10. I don't know what these are, but we could look them up. Uh, TACAN, T-A-C-A-N, and the Airborne Early Warning Systems. All of those sounded very impressive. I'm sure they are. So he states that the incident, again, late summer, early fall of 1965, occurred late at night after the lights on the ship were out during a watch shift. He actually said, I couldn't remember if it was the first watch or the second watch, but it was it was dark. It was late at night. Uh, Russian aircraft had been spotted recently. Uh, he said the 6th Fleet was on high alert for any potential maneuvers involving Russian aircraft or any uh, spy boats and the like. So they're kind of on an alert situation here. So the technician and air traffic controllers on the ship are observing three unidentified objects, he called them bogeys, on the radar. And they were following the fleet at a consistent distance of about 40 or 50 miles. And this happened for about an hour. Uh, despite, they, they tried reaching these bogeys. Let me, um, we don't need to share the screen the whole time. Um, so they're trying to reach these, these uh, unidentified aircraft. Uh, there's no responsiveness from them, and but the craft did maintain a consistent speed, essentially equivalent to that of the fleet. So this is unusual, and they decide to deploy three jets. The writer believed that they might have been F-4 Phantoms, but he wasn't 100% sure. He is writing many years after the fact here. But they send off three jets to investigate. The pilots were reaching some very good speed. Uh, he said about 13 more than 1,300 knots, but they did not make visual contact with the objects, although the technician was able to uh, see the objects on his radar. He had height-finding radar. That was the SPS-30, he said. So the, the event was so unusual, he said, that it prompted the presence of the air traffic controllers in the com to, to be in the combat information center that night. He said that was very, very unusual. You don't usually get that at night. Um, he described the uh, the displays that were used for the radar systems, radar system displays, excuse me, that were used to track this. Um, and he um, he said that as the jets attempted to approach these unknown objects, the objects began to move away rapidly, maintaining a triangular formation formation, which apparently they had been in for all this time. He then said within seven radar sweeps, the bogeys had completely disappeared from the radar, although the jets remained visible on the radar. Jets gave up their pursuit. What else can they do? They returned to the aircraft carrier. Following the incident, he said, radar operators were instructed, uh, stay vigilant for anything else like this, but the, uh, 
the two air traffic controllers uh, said to the technician, he said, this never happened. Uh, this particular incident, I think, is actually of all of the five that I have here, it's it's actually the least dramatic, still pretty interesting. So we're going to continue to the next one, and I will show you the. Um, this also is in the Azores Islands. So the Azores, by the way, are between uh, the coast of Portugal on the western tip of Europe, of course, and going east about 900 miles east. So it's in the Atlantic Ocean. There's a lot of ocean between the Azores and Europe. So it's a lot of deep water ocean there. And uh, it's interesting that the, this one that I'm about to describe also takes place here because this, uh, I have this as May 23rd, 1968. And it happens to be one day after the sinking of a U.S. nuclear submarine. It's only happened twice in in history, and this is the USS Scorpion. Um, there's a whole history on that. Uh, I'm not going to do the whole uh, sinking of the Scorpion here, but you can look this up. There's a whole Wikipedia page on it, of course, and there's all other kinds of pages on it. Uh, officially, there is no confirmed conclusion as to uh, how or why the scorpion uh, sank. It was an awful tragedy, but it did happen. The, um, there's all kinds of speculation. Was it uh, a malfunction on the on the submarine that happened? Was there something involving the Russians or some other other nation? Uh, it's not really known, or at least officially, it is not known. But what I did discover in looking into these USO cases is that there were several uh, apparent, let us say, sightings of anomalous underwater activity in connection with the aftermath of this. So I'm going to just uh, review some of it. So that was one of the, the cases here. Let me show you some bullets um, so you can follow along. So on the evening of, this is the evening of May 23rd, so the day after the scorpion disappeared, uh, around 9 p.m., there's a, a ship, the USS Monrovia APA-31. It had been, uh, it was en route, supposedly from the Mediterranean to Norfolk, Virginia, but it was, it was deployed to help look for the scorpion wasn't the only ship. There were others, but the Monrovia was one of them. So the writer of this account was on board the Monrovia. He said, uh, basically, they, blurred, uh, they observed a large submerged object on the starboard side of the ship, just behind the stern, behind the back. Uh, he referred to it as a USO. He said it was elongated. It had an oval shape. It admitted a trans, uh, like a luminescent orange glow. You're thinking, well, is he what, looking at the scorpion? No, he's not looking at the scorpion. He said it had a translucent quality, which is quite unusual. He said that the object seemed to mimic uh, several changes in their ship's course and speed. And he said it caused the compass and the radar and the radar equipment of the ship to malfunction. He said, essentially rendering them inoperable. Uh, as soon as the... USO appeared, he said it vanished. It didn't, he said it was uh, for about 90 minutes that it was under observation. It was witnessed, he said, by more than a thousand members of the crew, including a contingent of US Marines. And um, so somebody else wrote in uh, just to add some more information about that whole event. And you can take this for what it's worth. I, again, I don't have the visuals here for you, but. He basically said that in June of 1968, he's on this U.S. Navy ship called the Hyades, H-Y-A-D-E-S, uh, designation number AF-28. He said uh, that they were notified that the, the Scorpion was overdue. Its last known position was not far from the Azori Islands. And so they immediately went in to search the area. He said... Uh, it, that search lasted for three days and three nights. Uh, he said they were the first ship on station and searching. So 
Uh, I'm not sure that that's really true because this other guy was saying that they were looking in May. But this person had a lot of uh, information regardless. Uh, he said, the talking about the water depth, it's more than 10,000 feet deep in areas there. He talked about all these undersea mountains, these massive undersea mountains. He said, on the, this is the interesting part, on the second night of surging, he said, an object was reflected in the searchlight. And he described it as a 24 inch mercury arc light. Um, he said that he was a signal man on duty at the time. And he said, as the ship turned toward the object, whatever this thing was, went out of the beam and was lost due to the darkness. He said it was a cloudy night and there's no moon or stars. It was pitch black. Uh, so the way he described it, it made it sound like this thing had been seen in the light and then evaded somehow. Uh, I take it for what it's worth. Uh, the next day they were relieved uh, by other ships and that's essentially what he had there. This next case I have for you is from 1974. This involves a ship called the USS Forrestal CVA-59. This is another, I think, very interesting case. Uh, let me go to the uh, bullets here for you to follow along. So this is a, a situation in which you have an underwater light that outruns the ship. He describes it as one of the U.S. Navy's fastest ships, and which was followed by a, what he called a, a definite cover-up. So we're in the summer of 1974. We do not have an exact date here, uh, but what happens does seem quite extraordinary. Uh, the Forrestal was stationed in the Mediterranean Sea at the time. Uh, the writer was a signal man on board the ship. He was on duty during a regular night watch. As he's scanning the horizon from his position on the signal bridge, he sees an unusual reflection, which seems to be an underwater light about eight miles away from the ship. He quickly reports this sighting to the ship's control tower. Um, and even though sonar did not confirm the contact. The visual sighting was so strong that the, it brought the captain, uh, the executive order, the officer, that is the XO, the flight boss, and several intelligence officers to the deck. So this got a lot of attention. So for the next 20 minutes, they're all watching this mysterious object moving at high speeds across the bow of the ship. It's uh, zigzagging. And it's zigzagging at exceptional speeds. Remember, this is under the water, uh, estimated from anywhere to 60 miles per hour to over 100 miles per hour at a zigzag. Uh, very intriguingly, it stops directly in the path of the ship at one point, coming to within about four miles of the Forrestal. And at, at that point, it then just disappeared into the depths of the Mediterranean Sea and that was that. In the aftermath of this incident, the witness was ordered by the XO to remain silent about the uh, about what had happened. So, you know, quite remarkable. Uh, what I have here is the next one. I, I think is perhaps the most spectacular of the five. They're all interesting. Uh, this one concerns a ship known as the USS Glover or Glover. AGFF-1, and this is in the Bermuda Triangle. I, didn't, I had another Bermuda Triangle case I was going to show you from uh, 1973. I think I'll save that one for the future. That's also a very good one. Um, this one is also quite extraordinary, as you will see. There's some bullet points for it. So uh, this one has an exact date. This was given as June 15, 1977. The... Um, Writer was stationed on the USS Glover in the Bermuda Triangle. We don't have an exact uh, location within that, but it's presumably somewhere north of the Bahamas, east of the U.S. East Coast. It's you know out there in the in the beautiful Atlantic Ocean. So it's early morning on June 15, 1977. He's on the ship. They're in the Bermuda Triangle, and his the watch his watch duty. He's above the bridge. He's on the, the port side was interrupted by, he said, a bright red-orange circular object. And by the way, when I say early morning, I mean it's dark out, <laughs> okay? So uh, on the port side, uh, 
uh, of the grid of the ship, and it's this bright red orange circular object drops from the sky, he said, and comes toward their ship. Almost simultaneously, he said, the starboard watch, the other side of the ship, also spotted the object. So within moments, two other similar objects appeared. So there's three of them. And he said, this compelled us to report these three unidentified contacts to the bridge and to the Combat Information Center, that's the CIC. And then he says, suddenly uh, everything went haywire, in his words. Uh, he said, the, our ship lost all power, including radar and sonar. And he said, the ship came to a standstill in the water. I mean, I don't know how long that took. I mean, you know, it's a big ship. You have to assume it's got some forward momentum. But okay, however long it took, he said it either stopped or came to a, a virtual standstill, whatever. Uh, he said the three objects conducted incredible, astonishing, I think he said, ac acrobatic maneuvers across the sky. They form a triangle directly above the ship. Uh, this whole thing went for 20 minutes, during which time he, by the way, he said the weather was perfectly clear. The seas were calm. Uh, there were no clouds, nothing, except none of their stuff was working. Uh, so they're trying to, in, they're trying to keep CIC informed about everything that's going on, where the objects are and so forth. He says on the bridge, everything was chaos. He said the officers were in a state of panic. He said like they, how is it possible? They're thinking that the ship systems and the ship's engines had failed. That was their big concern, which yes, of course is going to be their concern. Uh, the whole culmination of this encounter came when the three objects converged. He said they formed a single bright orange circle uh, about 200 yards, he said, directly above the ship. So two football fields above the ship. It's not that far up there. Uh, and then he said, like, as quickly as they appeared, they just vanished. And immediately upon their departure, he said, the ship regained power, all systems rebo rebooted. It doesn't end there. Uh, there's a, a fascinating follow-up to this. He said later that night, they encountered a surface contact is on the water, moving, he said, at an estimated speed of 70 miles per hour. And he said it, it dived underwater without any slowdown. And, and, you know, that, by the way, is reminiscent of, um, you know, just recently, last week, the uh, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol uh, Service released uh, 10 videos uh, relating to UAP that they had there. And, and one of the, the most famous of those was the 2013 Aguadilla, Puerto Rico video, uh, which had leaked out back in 2015. Many of you remember, well, it was just officially released uh, last August. No one actually noticed when they were released. A bunch of uh, very dedicated UFO sleuths found them. And last week, the whole thing broke out and a lot of us were talking about it. Anyway, that video, if you recall, showed an object that seemed to split into two and also seemed to enter the water and also seemed to do so without losing speed. There's a lot of debate over what that is. Is that is that legit or not? I think I tend to think that's a legitimate UFO UAP event there, but uh, I I mean I can't say that I know. But here we have again a, a description from 1977 from a witness who said in this instance, an object goes into the water and it did not slow down. I just think that's noteworthy here. Um, he emphasized, you know, we tried, but we were not able to get a, a visual on this contact. He said, eventually this just thing, this thing went down into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, disappeared off of both their sonar and their radar screens. And that was that. And then he, uh, there's one final really fascinating uh, event to this whole sequence of events in the uh, in this story. He said the following morning, the crew was assembled on deck and was ordered, this is the whole crew apparently, ordered to forget everything they had witnessed. And he said, we were given a, basically a rather unbelievable explanation that we had seen an experimental 
Russian helicopter. Give him, he's like, he's like, are you kidding me? This was his essential answer in the uh, in what he wrote. He said this was absurd. Uh, it was obvious to him. I think it was obvious to everyone on the ship. There's nothing that anyone knew of that could do. There's certainly not a Russian helicopter. Which, by the way, out in the Bermuda Triangle, you have to ask, how would the Russians have gotten a helicopter to that location? They have some ship that was hiding out there. Maybe they did, but, <clears throat> I mean, it didn't strike anyone as a credible event whatsoever. Um, and then he just added that the whole aftermath was a, a severe morale, caused a real morale problem on the ship, for what it is worth, so... Uh, I think the implausible explanation was was part of that. They just kind of lost uh, lost some confidence in the honesty of their command. But hey, uh, I got to think that's something that they were that people in the military have been used to for a long period of time. So I have one more event here to share with you. This was from the summer of either 1980 or 1981. Uh, the writer, again, these are all submitted years after the fact. He wasn't quite sure. He served aboard the USS WS Sims FF 1059. And I just created some bullet points here for you to follow along. We're talking, uh, he wasn't sure which summer it was, but either 1980 or 1981. And he said, while I was on this ship, we received an urgent dispatch for our ship to go immediately to Puerto Rico, where he said there were reports of a Russian submarine that was exhibiting suspicious maneuvers in the waters of that area. So it wasn't clear if this was on the north of Puerto Rico or in the south of Puerto Rico, but that's where they were headed. So he said, like, the whole thing was shrouded in mystery, as far as he could say, mystery and urgency. So he said, on board the ship, there were divers, there were scientists, there were other experts all brought together solely for the purpose of investigating this underwater activity. And he said they spent several intense weeks working to uh, determine exactly what they were dealing with. And during this whole time, he's basically hearing rumors. So he's hearing what he called whispers from the divers who were part of the investigation. And he's, he heard, and I, apparently he wasn't really super clear, but I think this was after they arrived and after the divers were there, he said they referred to the incident as quote, another shag Harbor. Now I think a lot of you I'm sure are very familiar with the shag Harbor UFO, USO incident in 1967. Shag Harbor is in Nova Scotia, Canada, it's Eastern Canada. And in October of 1967, something came down into the waters there. And it was important enough that it got a significant amount of attention from Canadian divers. Uh, the United States Navy ended up got there very quickly. And also the Soviet, the Russian Navy, were in the background watching this whole thing as well. They were very interested. This was a significant event. Uh, Shag Harbor event has been investigated in great detail uh, by Don Ledger and Chris Stiles. Uh, they wrote a, a lot about this, and it's, a, it's an amazing case. So, But here you have 1980 or 81, where this is... You know, you wouldn't think that the Shag Harbor case would be that famous among non-UFO researchers at that particular time. But this guy said the Navy divers refer to this as another Shag Harbor. So that could give us an idea of what perhaps they were dealing with. He said, you know, at the time I had no idea what they were talking about. It was only years later. So I started looking at TV shows like Sightings and uh, the History Channel, Learning Channel, Discovery, and they said, oh, my God, there's a, there was a big UFO thing there. Uh, he said he also discovered that there were many reports of UFOs in the waters off of Puerto Rico, which, yes, absolutely, that is the case. I've seen the exact same thing. Um, but anyway, the wrap-up to this particular mission that he described was that he said we were, really were not given any 
uh, specific information. He, he said, at least we were not, I was not. He said, all we were told was that we had been studying a quote, natural phenomenon of undetermined origin. And that, um, that the phenomenon had an uncanny ability to elude detection at will. That's how he put it. So that you can't really imagine a natural phenomenon having an, a genuine will of its own. So that should give us a hint. He said it would elude detection at will only to reappear again. And that the whole thing, this pattern went on for about six weeks. Um, that was to the best of his recollection there. So, uh, by the way, Peter Davenport at the bottom of that particular post, uh, as he often will do, he encouraged other members of the crew of the USS WS Sims, um, anyone who might recall that mission, if they would want to share their experiences and recollections as well. I did not see any follow-ups to that. So that's five cases. And I must emphasize, these are a smattering of reports that are sitting in the New Fork database. Um, you know, that database gets many thousands of UFO reports every single year. Uh, even, even many that are done after the fact, like these old ones that I was uh, going over here with you. You know, I mean, there wasn't a, a, such a database to report this to in the 1960s or 70s, but it, it existed and uh, in later years and people were able to submit their cases. So we're very fortunate to have them, but there are just so many of these cases and so many military cases. Um, so I will be reporting on more of them in future programs. I can absolutely uh, assure you of that. I mean, need we discuss the implications of what we've got here? Again, back to data the quest for data. Uh, hey, you know, if the data isn't there, as the Pentagon folks are saying, it is not because no one was paying attention. Quite the opposite. If there's no data, it would be due to intentional suppression of that data. But I don't even think that's the case. I mean, even full suppression of all the data is simply not credible. The USS Glover incident is one example where that ship was, uh, I mean, if that account is to be believed, okay, fair enough. But that ship was without power for about a half hour. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, which I haven't discussed again here, but I've discussed elsewhere, the 1971 uh, incident involving the USS John F. Kennedy. I've talked about that before here, where that ship also allegedly lost power. Are, are you, is one anyone to believe that there's not going to be an exceptional level of documentation that would have to be prepared to the senior Navy command simply as a result of those ships losing power? It's, it's not credible to believe that they wouldn't have extensive documentation on these all important, exceptionally important, and expensive ships that have the lives of thousands of, of men on board. No, it is not credible to think that there would not be some level of detail in those reports. Um, or, going back to the 1968 uh, events around the Azores Islands, uh, connected perhaps to the sinking of the USS Scorpion, that is a nuclear submarine that is, that's, that's not a trivial event, far from it. The United States Navy has only lost two nuclear submarines. That is one of them. And anything connected to the investigation of that would have to be carefully uh, uh, analyzed and studied. It, again, it is not credible to think that this information would not be of interest, that did we see did we see this translucent glowing object under the water did we shine a light on an object that appeared to evade our beam i i think this is of prime interest uh to any organization that's in charge of you know 
such expensive, incredible pieces of equipment as a nuclear submarine. So again, we have to say it is not a credible statement that there is no data here. There's data. And it's a matter of where to find it. And not just the Glover, not just the USS Scorpion, all of the events that I mentioned here and countless others that have occurred within the history of the US Navy, or again, not to just single them out, the Army, the Air Force, the Coast Guard. I did a Coast Guard case here on this channel a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that was quite, quite fascinating indeed. So, I mean, is anyone really supposed to believe that the U.S. Navy command is that blasé about their ultra expensive and powerful, powerful ships that, that they take an exceptional amount of pride in, that they are literally to them the most important objects in the world? What is more important to a Navy command than its ships? So again, it is not remotely credible that there is no data on these types of events. Again, that's the Navy. We have an Air Force, we have an Army, we have a Coast Guard, we've got others. I will be coming back with accounts from those services in the future, but I still I certainly have many more with the Navy that I will be sharing with you. Meanwhile, do not be lulled by the tones of the Pentagon into thinking that they are honest players in this drama. They may feel that they have very good reasons to hold back on UAP information from you, but the fact is they are holding very much information back. That's the, that's the bottom line there. Well, that's all I have for you this time. I will be back again with more. Uh, I want to thank you for being here with me. If you like this video, please, as always, help me out. Like the video. Share it if you wish, if you think it's worth sharing. Uh, subscribe to my channel here if you haven't already done so. Always very grateful for that support. And if you really like what I do, by all means, check out what I've got at richarddolanmembers.com. Uh, I do this type of work on that website all the time also. And that's it. Again, thank you for being here with me. Uh, I'll be back again soon. And in the meantime, let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.